I'd like to bring up a point that I think is fundamental to anyone who seeks to collect drawings or other works of art, and that is an understanding of the materials with which these works of art are made. And as a conservator, it's been my uh, lifelong uh, desire to communicate an experience with the materials of works of art. Now, in the exhibition, there is a little display put together by Julie McLean of the materials, the beautiful piece of red chalk and black chalk and white chalk and some iron gall ink, all of which comes from our studio laboratory located here on the Smith College campus where we teach a course. There are three of us who teach um, this course on materials and techniques of old, uh, old master paintings and drawings. And uh, it is through this experience that Smith College students and also our colleagues at Harvard teach a course similar where all of this started. Uh, it's a wonderful way to connect students, anyone, with the object uh, that we're looking at. Is if you have the muscular experience of making a line with a piece of natural red chalk, you have an understanding of that. Uh, drawing that no one else has unless they do the same thing. Now, there's one aspect that, you, that the experience of the materials uh, gives you, not only an understanding of how the materials are handled and how it feels, but also you, we, give, we talk about how these materials change and age. And one of the very important aspects of drawings as ink, and there are many ink drawings in the show, and all of these ink drawings in the catalog are described as being paint done with brown ink. Now, all of our students make iron gall ink, and all of these, all of the drawings, I would submit that all of the drawings in the show are made with iron gall ink, which the artist would have seen as he used it, with a black, a deep, beautiful purplish black, which in a wash form would be a sort of a purplish color and a deep black in the ink drawing made with quill or uh, reed pen. And uh, so that when you look at these drawings, the ink drawings, you have to do an act of reconstruction in your mind in order to understand that these drawings all originally were black ink. And so uh, this is one of the things that our students would understand because we make iron gall ink. But so um, my plea is for, uh, I, I was very interested that um, one of um, Suzanne's collectors was an artist and really with not much uh, scholarly background simply through her experience of handling the materials, had developed a certain, a very beautiful aesthetic eye for her selection of drawings. So that I would suggest that uh, knowledge of the materials, both intellectual knowledge, what the materials are and how they're handled and how they age, and um, the experience of using these materials is a very important piece of knowledge that's often neglected. I think that's very important. I think you've made two points that are worth thinking about. The first is that every curator, and I mean I could say collector as well, ought to have the experience of actually trying to do it themselves. And only by doing it, trying to do it, do you have a greater appreciation of the skill and achievement of the artists whose drawings that we, we collect and look after. Um, and I don't know if it's still true uh, here at Smith, but certainly when I was a, an art history student here, it was a prerequisite. You had to take a studio course. And I think, and I don't know of any other university where that is so, that it, the students are forced to take one studio course so they do understand. And it is an important and, and useful and really fun exercise. Um, recently, for 
complicated reason, we needed a big team building exercise between several groups of people at the Rijksmuseum, all of whom were involved either in a curatorial capacity or digitization or um, cataloging of drawings and prints in the printing cabinet. And we took them off for the afternoon and we all made prints together. So we actually understood. So I think that that's an easier thing to do. Your second point, which is, I think, different, and we need to encourage more communication with the conservation departments of the museum so that the curators and the conservators have more interaction so they understand the historical consequences and changes, because that's not something we can go off for an afternoon um, and, and see the, uh, the, the black iron gall ink turn brown overnight. Still going. I would just like to say that those of us who collect old master drawings um, also care very much about their preservation. And I think this is where our natural bent would be to give our collections to museums because we, we know they'll be safe and cared for properly and not, not exposed to long, long periods of light. Uh, and no bright light. So uh, I think this is a, a natural for collectors of, of works on paper and especially old master drawings, so ma many of which are done in chalk. And uh, so again, I think this is another close tie. And if we can possibly afford to leave the collection to the public, I, I really think uh, that it is our first responsibility to the artwork. My kids certainly know that. <laughs> you might be able to trust your own children to take care of them, but what about their descendants? <laughs> Think about it, your grandchildren. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I would just say as a curator, better make a division. <laughs> better what? Some, some things to come to the museum, some things to go to the children, and so forth. <laughs> Um, no one today or yesterday has said anything about deaccessioning. And I remember when the Whitney Museum sold off their great 19th century landscapes, which they couldn't hope to replace, when uh, the Museum of Modern Art took most of the paintings out of their original frames. And uh, more recently, the National Academy got in hot water with AEM over deaccessioning a couple of pieces. And at the very same time, the Birchfield Penny Foundation uh, or, and Museum uh, has sold Birchfield's work, which certainly was, wasn't what Birchfield or Penny had in mind, on a regular basis, uh, every other year or something, at a commercial gallery and uh, these weren't third-rate pieces. And I asked, I wrote to the AAM about that and got a very vague answer. And they seemed to do nothing to police it. So, uh, you know, I think for most of us, if we give something to a museum, uh, we don't want it to turn around and wind up at auction. Or You're whatever. here. I think that's absolutely right. I think that if you, and that's in a sense, you can, ensure that, at least as far as you can, by making that very clear in the donation. In other words, I think if you, if you decide that you want to give your work to Smith or to Princeton or to the Met or to the National Gallery or to the Morgan Library, generally I think it's the collector, the owner, who decides what they want to go where. And I would absolutely encourage anybody who donates a work of art to a museum, first to make sure the museum wants it, and then if the museum has any possibility of deaccessioning, we don't at the National Gallery, but if the museum has any possibility of deaccessioning, to put that in the deed of gift, that you really want the work of art to stay there. I think the, the, the gallery is in a kind of position which was set by our trustees very early in our life, back at the beginning in the 1940s, 
that we would not deaccession any unique work of art given to the museum. Perhaps a duplicate print, perhaps a duplicate photograph, but no drawings, no paintings. And so we try to be careful on the way in, we say, because there is really no possibility by, not by law, but by practice. And I think it's a practice which is very encouraging to donors to know that their works will be there forever. Um, but for other museums which do have the possibility for deaccessioning, I absolutely agree with you. I think if you want to give something to a museum and you want it to stay there, say that right up front. Well, I think one of the questions that we might be interested in is how to create, empower a new generation of collectors because the level of collecting that we're addressing today is extremely high. People who have means to acquire the very best objects and also a, um, a history perhaps of, of knowledge already. I have to credit Smith College with, during my day in the 1960s, with first bringing in dealers, you know, print dealers, who, and, and, and in those days, in the 60s, there were many itinerant dealers, uh, so that the very first time you buy, say, a 15th century or early 16th century woodcut for $6, you know, that's what it was back then, just making as for an 18-year-old student to do that for the first time, it is so empowering to buy that very first piece and understand that you too can do it. And it could be encouraging students to also buy works of art students. But it's just make, as Mark, as you said, you can't just keep going to the art fairs and look. It's making that first step. And then all of a sudden, you look at every work of art as could I have this? What is my... And the other thing is that there are people in your lives, and in this case, some of my professors, um, and one professor in particular, Leonard Baskin, who would, you'd be invited to their homes to look at the things. So if your professors are there, you invite your students. It makes it possible. You understand in your own mind that it's not just museums or very powerful collectors, but it's real people that you know, and then you can do it too. So I encourage universities, colleges, um, anybody who has the possibility of making that collecting experience accessible to do so, and then people develop their taste. I think this can still be done. Um, I think uh, um, this, this is how all generations begin collecting, and it still can be done here, whether it's in the old master field, the 19th century field, the 20th century field, whether it's prints or drawings or small sculptures or whatever. I mean, when I first bought a drawing, I think the first thing I bought was about $700. Um, that was in the 80s. It probably wasn't a very good drawing, but it, it, now you, could, you can still buy in certain fields, even in, this, in the drawings field, old master and 19th century drawings, you can still buy remarkably beautiful drawings connected with projects you know, in beautiful condition for well under $2,500. And, you know, anywhere from 500, we used to do an exhibition every year, not recently, but we're doing one this year, of something called a, a, sort of a sort of a jokey sort of Christmas show. But we sold works of art up to $10,000 from $100 on up. And they were actual drawings by actual masters, um, you know, to basically new collectors and old collectors, uh, or powerful collectors, you, as you say. <laughs> that was a wonderful expression. Powerful collectors are real people, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, who just were amused to buy them at that level. But that is where you start. And the important thing, though, is to start, is to, is to buy some, if you're interested in being a collector. You know, I mean, I think, but it's still possible to buy at, uh, at, a, at a very, uh, reasonable level, and beautiful, and I would say important works of art. Works of art that can, could be in the National Gallery. I mean, you know, there's no question. It just depends on the area you buy in. Yeah. 